Imagine holding a mustard seed in your hand. It's tiny. I mean, like, itty-bitty, teeny-tiny. Seemingly insignificant. You wouldn't expect much from it. But when planted, it grows into this big old bush. I mean, really, when you look at it, you think it's a tree. It's big enough that, that birds can come and make nests in it. Animals can, can live in it and find shelter. And Jesus used this as an illustration of how something small, something seemingly insignificant can grow to have a powerful impact. In a similar way, the cross, a place of suffering, humiliation, and weakness became the source of salvation and the very foundation of our Christian faith. Jesus took what seemed weak and turned it into the ultimate display of God's glory and power. The gospel shows us that true glory isn't found in power or in fame, but in humility, sacrifice, and love. Philippians 2, 6 through 8 says, who, though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself by taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men, and being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. This passage sets up the theme that we'll be looking at today, which is Jesus' glory is revealed in his humility and his obedience to the Father. There are numerous aspects of the cross of Christ that Scripture reveals. And first, let us discover the cross as a radical reversal of glory. Jesus' actions on the cross, they contradicted expectations. For the Romans and Jews, glory meant power, status, and control. But Jesus shows that true glory is in self-giving love and humility. Paul writes about this in our scripture text for today. 1 Corinthians 1.18, For the word of the cross is folly to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. So there are two different lenses that we can look at the cross through. One is through the lens of the world, the lens of the world, and the other is through the lens of God's kingdom. Jesus said, and if I be lifted up, I will draw all people to me. I'll draw them to me. Many Christians believe that Jesus was looking ahead to the cross when he made this proclamation. Thus, it's not enough to simply know about the cross of Christ, but to allow the cross of, or the Christ of that cross to draw us closer to his great example of self-giving, self-sacrificial love. The late theologian John Stott had this to say on that matter. The cross is the blazing fire at which the flame of our love is kindled, but we have to get near enough for its sparks to fall on us. It is in the shattering of our expectations of how the Messiah would ultimately conquer sin that we are drawn closer and not just for greater understanding, but also for transformation. 
The next thing we can learn is that the cross is the ultimate display of love. Now, I'm not sure that we can ever fully grasp the depth of God's love in Jesus' willingness to endure the cross. Love often involves sacrifice. And Jesus showed the ultimate act of love by suffering for our sins. He took our guilt, our shame, our wrongdoings, and he placed them all upon himself. Imagine that weight. Imagine that burden. Jesus, in his innocence, took on the punishment for our guilt. And not because he was coerced, not because he was forced into it, it was because his love for us was so great. I'm still flabbergasted by the truth that Paul reveals in Romans 5, 8. But God shows his love for us and that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Think for a moment about how you view love, how you view sacrifice. Christ himself said that there is no greater love than when you are willing to lay down your life for a friend. Jesus' love is radical because it, it reaches us in our worst state. It reaches us in our selfishness, which is probably the thing that we all wrestle with the most. And while it might be easy to point fingers at the lack of faith in the children of Israel or to harshly judge the lack of love for those in the crowd who called for Barabbas to be freed and for Jesus to be killed, we should all pause and recognize that if we don't have the love of God in our hearts, then we would have also found ourselves on the wrong side of those histories too. Martin Luther, who was known for (laughs) really just saying how he felt, he put it this way, if I had been there, I would have nailed him to the cross myself. That is the truth. Now, I don't say all of this as a guilt trip, but instead to, to emphasize the love of Christ. Jesus' love is so profound that it encompasses even those who reject him. This truth leads me to agree with the old Southern folk hymn, which asks the question, oh, what wondrous love is this? Now, along with the with revealing the all-encompassing love of Christ, the cross also reveals his perfect obedience to the Father. Mere hours before his trial and eventual execution, Jesus took time to go to the foot of the Mount of Olives and to go into what was known as the Garden of Gethsemane. It was Gethsemane, it, it, it means olive press. And Jesus was pressed there. Jesus was burdened there. Jesus was, had, a, had an immense weight upon him there and in great agony from that tremendous burden of the entire history of mankind's sins being poured upon him. Jesus called out saying, Father, if you are willing, remove this cup from me. Nevertheless, Not my will, but yours be done. Jesus had a choice in this matter. And he chose to trust his father. He was willing to submit to the will of God despite the exorbitant cost. The immense cost. And 
I believe his obedience, Christ's obedience, is a model for us, teaching us that God's glory is often revealed through submission and surrender. Dear friends, obedience is hard when you don't know the motives and heart of the one who is giving the command, which is why it is so important for us to be rooted and grounded in the truth of God's love for us. He has our best interest at heart. And even when we can't clearly see the end from the beginning of any specific circumstance or decision, he does. He does. Jesus' obedience is the way to life and freedom. Thus, he sets an example for our own surrender to God. The cross of Christ can also teach us that God's power is perfected in weakness. As I mentioned already, Jesus was weighed down and pushed to his limits in the garden of Gethsemane. Yet that's where the greatest strength started to come through. Paul wrote the following in 2 Corinthians 12, 9. But he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you. For my power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly of my weaknesses so that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Paul's words resonate with Jesus' work before and then on the cross. Jesus shows that real power lies not in avoiding suffering, but enduring it for the sake of others. Richard Foster wrote, the cross life is the life of voluntary chosen sacrifice. It is the life of freely accepted servanthood. Freely accepted servant. Jesus' power on the cross shows that servanthood is the true measure of strength. It's what Jesus lived for. And it's what he's calling us to as well. His servant spirit is ours to unlock because his spirit dwells within us. So with all of that said, we can't really talk about the cross of Christ without also talking about the resurrection of Christ. We must begin to view the resurrection as the culmination of his glory. The resurrection confirms the power of Jesus' sacrifice, proving that love and humility conquer death. He didn't stay in the grave. That tomb is still empty today. And if you won't take my word for it, then maybe you'll heed this revelation from the words of Scripture. Romans 6, 4. We were buried, therefore, with him by baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in newness of life. Jesus' glory is fully revealed in his victory over the grave, affirming that the way of the cross leads to life and life eternal. And the beautiful thing is that we don't have to experience physical death in order to receive this new life. We accept Christ's death in our place through faith. And we signal our reception of this free free gift through the ritual of baptism. Baptism is a powerful thing because it points us back to the cross. 
it is in essence our putting on the ambassador's uniform for the kingdom of God. Sharing the good news of the gospel with the world and inviting everyone to come and join on the Lord's side. I like the way N.T. Wright puts it. The resurrection completes the inauguration of God's kingdom. It is the decisive event demonstrating that God's kingdom really has been launched on earth as it is in heaven. Jesus did a lot of talking. Jesus did a lot of preaching. But it wouldn't have mattered if he went to the cross and then stayed in the grave. He would have shown us love, yes, but where was be the power in the kingdom? He didn't stay in the grave. And whatever grave that sin has dug for you, whatever grave that you might feel like you are in right now, you don't have to stay in that grave either. There is resurrection power in the cross of Christ. As beautiful as this knowledge we've gained today concerning the cross of Christ, the power of the cross, it needs to be shown in our lives. It's powerless in our lives until we begin to believe, receive, and practice it in our daily walk. As we close, let me give you a few practical ways so that you can apply the glory of the cross this week and beyond. Number one, embrace humility in relationships. I invite you to consider how you might embrace humility in your interactions with others, especially with those who may challenge or frustrate you. This is especially prudent when, when it comes to coworkers or it, it comes to family that lives under your roof. The people that you're, you're interacting with every single day. Remember, humility is not weakness. And control is not power. <laughs> humility is the willingness to put others' needs before our own, reflecting Christ's own posture on the cross. This week, Try practicing humility in a specific situation. It could mean listening without interrupting, responding kindly when frustrated, or offering forgiveness even when you may feel like someone doesn't deserve it. It was while we were still sinners that Christ died for us. Ask God to, to help you reflect his love, his kindness, his humility to others through your words and actions. Amen. Number two, find strength and surrender. I invite you to identify areas of your life where you feel the need to be in control. Jesus' journey to the cross is a picture of surrender of trusting God's plan even when it was painful and uncertain. I encourage you to, to pray daily, surrendering any worries or burdens, surrender them to God. Surrender them to God. Try using verbiage like, Lord, I trust you with this. I trust you with this. Whatever it is, even if it feels uncomfortable, This isn't in my notes, but I, I, would, I would just submit to you that if you are praying and on a weekly basis, there is not some time in your prayer with God that you are feeling a little bit uncomfortable, <laughs> I would encourage you to surrender a little bit more. Surrender is an act of strength. Trusting that God is present and that he will keep his word. He will provide for us. Third, serve others sacrificially. Jesus' love led him to serve sacrificially. I invite you to look for small ways to serve others in your life with that same love. Whether it's helping a neighbor, 
whether it's volunteering time or simply being there for someone who asks for your support. It might not be convenient, but that's what being a servant is about. I challenge each of you to do one act of sacrificial service this week. Just start with one act. You don't have to end there, but start there. Something that might cost you time, energy, or resources. This is a way to live out the cross and experience firsthand the joy that comes from giving selflessly. Fourth, find glory in weakness. Find glory in weakness. I, I want to emphasize that just as God's power was displayed in Jesus' weakness on the cross, his power is often revealed in our own weaknesses. I think that we do a disservice for our own spiritual walk in faith when we constantly try to hide our weaknesses from ourselves, from others, or God forbid, from him. <laughs> It's okay to admit, I can't do this. It's okay to admit, I don't have the answer here. It's okay to admit, I need help. Instead of hiding or being ashamed of struggles, we can bring them to God, trusting that he will use them for good. He has a way of, of, of turning things over. We were talking about that earlier, Heather, right? That, that really God's kingdom, when you, when you look at, at what Jesus preached about the kingdom, it's essentially, okay, you know how the world works and it works like this. God's kingdom is that flipped upside down. <laughs> I encourage you to be honest with God about your weaknesses, about your fears, about your struggles. I invite you to pray this simple prayer. God, I need your strength in my weakness. Just open that door. <laughs> you may also consider opening up to a trusted friend or group for prayer and support, finding strength in Christian community. We're not in this alone. The enemy wants us to believe that we're in this alone. But we have the spirit of Christ within us and we have the spirit of Christ within each other. And finally, Practice gratitude for Jesus' sacrifice. Now, Laurie, you, you did this children's story and you left this up and you wanted me to, to be mindful of all the things to be grateful for and that our kids were grateful for. And you were like, I believe you can work it into the sermon. The Spirit already did. <laughs> the Spirit already did that. <laughs> Hallelujah. Remember, the cross is a daily invitation to gratitude. We didn't ask for it. We didn't deserve it. We didn't earn it, but it was given to us anyway. When you think about the cross in your day-to-day -day life, it's a good time to pause and express that gratitude to God. Thank you, Lord. Thank you for your love. Thank you for your sacrifice. Jesus' ultimate act of love calls us to respond with awe and thankfulness, recognizing that his humility opened the way for our salvation. It starts with Jesus. I encourage you to take a few minutes each day this week to reflect on what the cross means to you personally, both now and for eternity. It can be as simple as, as beginning each morning or ending each evening with a short prayer. Thank you, Jesus, for your sacrifice on the cross. Thank you. Those are two powerful words when they're put together. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Dear friends, through the easy times and the more difficult moments, Jesus is on your side. And he has promised to never leave you or forsake you. Amen. And so I leave you with this. Hebrews 12, 2. Looking to Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. None of us knows exactly what the future holds, 
yet we'd always do well to remember the glory of the cross. Amen and amen. As we have our closing prayer, I'm going to invite Brandon to come forward, and he will be available down those steps. And after I have the benediction, I will step down on this side. And if there's anybody here who has any specific needs, any special requests, or maybe just praises that you would like to share, then we just invite you to come forward. We'd love to speak with you and lift that petition, lift that praise up to the throne of grace. Let us pray. Our loving, gracious, heavenly Father, Lord, we are so thankful for Jesus. We are overwhelmed with gratitude when we reflect upon the cross of Christ and how difficult it was for him, how burdensome, how how crushing, how painful, yet how freeing and, and liberating and powerful it was for us. But Lord, I can imagine as as the Roman soldiers looked on and as some of the Jews that were there looked on, they saw Christ and and they just couldn't help but, but think, oh, how shameful, how despised. Yet they didn't realize that the kingdom was being unveiled and that the ways of the world were being turned on their head. And Jesus showed us a better way, a truer way, the way of sacrificial love which brings true power, true strength. And so, Lord, as we go through our life, we never want to cease being grateful for the cross. We never want to cease recognizing the glory of the cross. And so, Lord, as you began your kingdom there on that hill called Calvary, you have invited us to be a part of it. You've invited us to be ambassadors, and we want to take this message and share it with the world. There are people that need to hear it. There are people that need to know that there is a God who is alive, who cares, and who loves them, and has shown that love in the most powerful way. So Lord, give us opportunities this week to live out this glory, this power from the cross, and give us opportunities to share this gospel message with those who need to hear it. And so Lord, We give ourselves to you in the same way that you gave yourself to us, completely and totally. And we seal this prayer in the powerful name of Jesus. Amen and amen.